Alrighty, and welcome to module 3.8 where we're going to be looking at polymerization reactions. So we've just got a short unit here, just a, a chance to stop and look at basically how do we make plastics, uh, what are they made up of and how do we get to the final product and, and what the different sorts of versions there are out there. So first things first, we want to know uh, a couple of key words here. We want to know the word polymer and we want to know the word monomer. Now polymer, if you break it down, the word polymer it starts off with poly and poly means many. Pretty much any time you see it, it means many. Uh, mer, on the other hand, this basically means unit. So the word polymer means many units. Um, now polymers are long chain molecules that consist of many repeating units called monomers. So you can see there that a polymer, its name is actually telling you what it is. Now a monomer, on the other hand, if you uh, know your word uh, elements, you might realize that mono means one. And again, we've got mer here, so this means unit. So a monomer would be one unit. So you can sort of think of it a little bit like if a monomer is a bead, a polymer is a chain made up of those beads. Now, there are kind of a couple of different ways we can classify polymers. We can have synthetic polymers. These are ones that are produced by chemical reactions. Normally, they're the sort of thing where we synthesize it in a lab. Things like nylon, like plastic, uh, different types of plastic polymers uh, would fit into this category. On the other hand, we do also have what we call naturally occurring polymers. These are proteins, DNA, cellulose, stuff we find in nature that are made up of long chain molecules of lots of repeating things. And so you've got a few examples or images down the bottom there. So this first one, you can see if our monomer looks like this, then our polymer is that pattern repeated. You've got one there, another one here, another one here, another one here. Um, over the right side here, we've got what we call vinyl chloride. You've got two carbons, uh, three hydrogens and a chlorine, and that's the monomer here. Now you can see there is two bonds between those carbons. When that monomer undergoes a what we call polymerization reaction, that gets broken and turned into a single bond. And so if you look at the polymer over here, it's only single bonds between them, but you can actually see if you've got two carbons, you've got two carbons here, and you've got three hydrogen and one chlorine. And again, two carbons, three hydrogens, one chlorine. And again here, and again here. So basically that's just a snapshot of the longer polymer. And what we do when we name them is we act, whack the um, prefix poly in front of whatever the monomer was called. So this was called vinyl chloride. So we call it polyvinyl chloride, which actually you're probably familiar with. It is PVC. So that's sort of the underlying um, idea behind polymers. Uh, they're chains of many repeating monomer units. So like I was saying, that reaction that joins those monomers together to form a polymer is what we call polymerization. So you can see here, it's kind of looking at a couple of different ways. If your monomers are circles, okay, you've got lots of individual circles along here, and then you join them together and they form one big chain. The practical example there with something here, we've got ethylene. Uh, and so ethylene is a little bit like vinyl chloride, but instead of having a chlorine, it actually just has four hydrogen. When you break that double bond and you join all those together, you end up with polyethylene down here as one big chain. But if you break that down and you say put cuts through there and there, you can actually see you've got the same molecule as what's just here. Um, one pretty common uh, monomer that we use is something called tetrafluoroethene and that's over here where you've got two carbons and you've got four fluorine attached to it. When you turn that into a monomer you'd probably technically call that polytetrafluoroethene but we actually just call that Teflon. Uh, so that's what's on your non-stick pans and that sort of thing. So a few more facts about polymers. Um, there's another way you can classify your polymer and it's based off the kinds of monomers you have in it. If you have the same monomer throughout, if you have the same monomer throughout, we call it a homopolymer. Homo in science actually just means same. So when all the monomers are the same, we call it a homopolymer because they're all the same. So Teflon would be an example of this because you use the same tetrafluoroethene monomer all throughout and you don't have any other ones. So you can see in our diagram here, they're all blue um, little shapes joined together. However, if you have two different monomers, you can get what we call a copolymer. And that's where you might go blue, purple, blue, purple, blue, purple, like we've got in the diagram there. So nylon would be an example of this. There's actually two different monomers and it um, creates one long chain where they alternate between the two. Now, most monomers also contain the element carbon. And so by default, polymers also contain the element carbon. In fact, you'll often have that 
core of that polymer is a carbon uh, chain and it's the things coming off the carbons that give the um, polymer its different properties. And like I was saying earlier, we tend to put poly in front of uh, whatever the monomer term is when we want to know what the polymer's name is. So if you have um, vinyl acetate as your monomer, you'll get polyvinyl acetate or PVA. So some pretty common compounds are actually polymers and we don't even realize we're using the, their polymer names. Now, polymers and plastics are not the same thing. Polymers are just long chain molecules. And like I was saying earlier, this can include some natural ones like DNA. DNA is not a plastic, but it is a polymer. However, when we talk about plastics, we are talking about something that is made up of polymers. So plastics are made up of polymers, um, but not all polymers are plastics. In fact, um, What's really interesting is the word plastic comes from the Greek word plastikos, which happens to mean able to be molded. And it's actually a word we use in other areas of science, but basically plastics are a material or a polymer that you can then actually mold into different things. Now, all plastics are products of chemical reactions. We actually have to do some chemical reactions to produce a plastic. Some are easier than others. And some plastic we, plastics we find are flexible, and if you heat them, they will soften. In fact, they might even melt and that sort of thing. Great if you want to reform them and reshape them because you can remold them. Well, first of all, you can mold them easily into something, but then you can actually easily recycle them and mold them into something new. Um, other plastics tend to be really quite rigid, uh, and they don't soften when heat, heated. In fact, if you try heating them, they tend to burn and catch fire and blacken and that sort of thing. And this is actually really handy because we don't always want flexible plastic. Sometimes we want ones that are going to hold up to um, a bit of pressure and that sort of thing. So you don't really want a, a toilet sleep seat that when you sit on it uh, just falls apart or just bends too easily and drops you in the toilet. So toilet seats are actually made out of a different type of plastic. So uh, things like lamp holders and bench tops. So we actually have a, different, a few different kinds of uh, plastic polymers out there. So... The first category, those flexible ones, are called thermoplastic polymers. Now, thermoplastic, it's a bit of a clue there. So thermo means sort of heat. And as we were just saying before, plastic means like moldable um, and you can reshape it and that sort of thing. So these are uh, polymers that when you expose them to heat, allow you to remold them and that sort of thing. So these are the ones that will melt easily and they soften when they're heated. If you've ever tried to put like a, um, a plastic honey container or honey squeeze bottle in the microwave and you've put it in there because the honey was all hard and you try to soften it, um, you might have found that the bottle actually or container started to melt as well. And that would be because it's made up of a thermoplastic polymer. Now, they don't stay um, all melty. They will cool down. And when that happens, they solidify into whatever new shape they're in. Um, and so that's really handy because you can remold them into useful products while they're hot and then they'll cool down and you've got it set in that shape. So there is a really key reason in terms of their structure why this happens. Uh, if you look at the diagram on the right, you can, you can see you've got all these chains of polymers, but there's nothing joining the actual chains together. There's joins between the individual monomers of the chain but there is no bonds between the polymer chains. And this means when they heat up, they can easily slide past each other and they just melt and fall apart. All right, we're going to look at another one that doesn't do this um, and it's got to do with structure of the polymer chains. Some examples of a thermoplastic polymer would be polyethene, uh, which is like your cling film, your squeeze bottles, um, PVC, polyvinyl chloride also happens to be one, shoe soles, packaging, floor tiles. Um, you might see a whole variety of how like PVC is in terms of rigidity and that sort of thing. And that's got to do with how long the chains are and you can have different length ones, but it is a thermoplastic polymer. So you would expect when heated, it's actually going to melt. So the other kind of polymer is what we call a thermo setting. So thermo again, meaning heat and setting kind of, it's not any funny Greek word or anything like that. It's just telling you that um, once you've, sort of um, if you apply heat it's going to stay set okay so these are ones that don't soften when they heat but instead they're going to char or blacken instead and that's because as you um, heat them up there are bonds called cross links you can see over here in the diagram these cross links are between the polymer chains and when you heat it up you actually end up breaking those bonds which tends to release carbon and carbon happens to be black so that's why when you heat them up and you're breaking those cross link bonds that ends up depositing carbon, which we see as blackening. So we say it chars and blackens. 
Now, thermosetting polymers tend to be more hard and rigid and actually even sometimes quite brittle. So if you drop them, they'll break. And this all comes down to those crosslinks. The crosslinks between the polymers, um, it says monomers there, but it's sort of they're between individual monomers of different chains. It's not monomers in the same chain. It's monomers in different chains are holding on to each other and, and connecting the different polymer chains together. And so that really creates this inflexible plastic where the polymer chains can't easily slide past each other um, as they heat up and that sort of thing. So there's a lot less movement and it's a lot more rigid in that. Now, like I was saying, you can see here it says strong heating can break down the crosslinks, leaving the black element carbon. Some examples of thermosetting polymers are Bakelite, which are what you might find door handles used to be made of. It might still be electrical switches. We probably don't use Bakelite as much anymore, but it's pretty popular when it was first invented in the 50s. Um, melamine is another one, and that could be your bench tops. Sometimes um, you might even have, um, I think, plates can, like kitty plates can be made out of it and that sort of thing. Um, really hard plastics that you don't want to try heating because um, they're not going to melt, they'll actually burn on you and that sort of thing. Now, a bit of a, a human interest story here. Uh, plastic Fantastic. We were actually the first country in the world to use only plastic notes. So Australia has a bit of a, a special place in the world when it comes to plastics because we invented the plastic uh, banknote. So your 5 10 20 50 $100 banknotes, the plastic ones that we've got, unlike, say, America, which uses a, a form of paper currency, we actually invented that. And if you go to another country that uses plastic notes, they only have it because we invented it, which is very, very cool. Now, they were actually first introduced between 1992 and 1996, a little bit like what's happening now where we're reintroducing these new designs. Um, and it's only happening now, so it's been quite a while. But they didn't do it in all in one hit. It was actually over a longer period of time, kind of like what we're doing now. So we've got a couple of videos here. The first one is um, the old TV ad uh, when they were first introducing all the different notes and you can watch the video and see them introducing every single one of them. And then the second one's just a new ad that they've put out just for the most recent $5 notes. So I'm gonna play them now. Uh, you can watch them and uh, then that will take us right through to the end. So uh, I'll play this first one here. Let me introduce a masterpiece of Australian design and technology. Australia's new $5 plastic note. One way to tell the note is genuine is this see-through area. Hold the note to the light and you can see Australia's coat of arms and these seven points form a perfect star. This leaflet explains the security safeguards the Reserve Bank has included to make our currency more secure. There was movement at the station, but the word had passed around that a cult from old regret had got away and had joined the wild bush horses. You all know the words, but it's the first time you've seen them on a banknote. It's no ordinary note, however. It's Australia's new polymer $10 note, and it was developed and printed right here. It uses microprinting and other security features that make it much harder to counterfeit than paper notes. So when you get one, you'll be holding one of the world's most advanced and secure notes. The security here is amazing because this is where they're printing Australia's new $20 note. It all starts on this specially prepared sheet of polymer with the first high security device already in place. Throughout the printing process, many other security devices are added, like microprinting in the portraits of Australian pioneer Mary Raby and John Flynn, founder of the Royal Flying Doctor Service. So take a close look at our new 20 and see how Australian technology using polymer is making our currency the safest in the world. I'd like to introduce you to our new $50 polymer note. This is David Unipon, inventor and our first published Aboriginal author. And this is Edith Cowan, our first female parliamentarian. Now this note has unique anti-counterfeiting features, like this clear window developed here in Australia to help make our currency safer for you. <laughs> Dame Nellie Melba, Australia's famous international opera star. Sir John Monash, a renowned leader in military and civilian life. Both are featured on our new $100 note, which completes the series of polymer notes. Notes that lead the world in the fight against counterfeiters. The new note has all the innovations, like the clear window, that make our currency the safest in the world. 
Australian banknotes are among the safest in the world. And to keep them that way, the Reserve Bank is introducing a new series of banknotes. Now in circulation is the new $5 banknote. You'll see many innovative security features, including a distinctive top to bottom window. Tilt the banknote and you'll see an eastern spine bill move its wings. Inside the Federation Pavilion at the bottom of the window is a number five that changes direction. Turn the banknote over and in the top corner you'll see a prominent patch that changes colour in a rolling effect. And there's a tactile feature to assist the vision impaired community. Importantly, all existing banknotes can continue to be used. The Reserve Bank is making our banknotes clearly more secure. See more at banknotes.rba.gov.au. All right, there we go. Well, hopefully you enjoyed uh, seeing some of those videos there. Now, just remember, if there was anything in this video you didn't understand or you need to go back over, you're more than welcome to re-watch it. You can jump back to the bits you didn't understand. You could speed it up, slow it down, whatever you need to do to get that information. If you still have any questions, don't forget to go and speak to your teacher. They're more than happy to help you. Anyway, that's all for today. Thanks for watching.